few years ago, I watched The Queen's Gambit with my dad. As I followed along, I started developing what you could call a chess superiority complex. I'd been playing chess somewhat competitively for nearly a decade now, so I felt that it was my duty to lecture my dad on everything from the similarities between Beth and Bobby Fischer to the technicalities of that final queen sacrifice against Borgov. And for some reason, my ability to articulately recite information from a chess database gave me the epiphany that maybe I have the potential for a career in chess. From the looks of the series, all that was left to do was to take a few shots and conquer the competition. Unfortunately, I went from shooting for the likes of Beth Harmon to getting steamrolled by the likes of Glistening Hippopotamus 123 online within the next half hour. <laughs> Over the years, though, I've realized that you don't have to be the next prodigy for chess to be a meaningful activity. In fact, there are about 30 times more possible chess positions than atoms in the observable universe. So while you're not going to run out of options, you also probably won't become a grandmaster. But there's much more to chess than pointless memorization and the social ineptitude that comes with it. Without ever having to get close to the grandmaster level, chess can change the way you think and even be good for your social life. Let's start with the more sensible idea here that chess players are nerds, so that's probably doing something good for their brains. I started my chess journey at a co-curricular Chinese chess program in kindergarten. Being a goofy and aloof kid whose primary interests were watching the garbage trucks in the morning and airplanes taking off, there was an enormous wall between me and anything intellectually stimulating. Let's call the other side of this barrier the brain gym. Now, this wall seemed insurmountable for two main reasons. First, I physically wasn't able to climb it because of my lack of cognitive development. Words, numbers, common sense, and an overall societal compass, not my thing quite yet. Second, it was hard to be motivated to go to the brain gym. It required lots of effort for a little human sapling like me and was not fun or entertaining. That's enough to get high schoolers to hate something, much less a small child like I was. On the other hand, Chinese chess was fun because it was a game. For all I knew, the pieces looked cool, I could play with anyone I wanted, I could win, and hey, I could throw a rook at anyone I didn't like. This really easy-to-grasp framework of Chinese chess also allowed little me to perform relatively advanced cerebral activities. I had to associate pieces with movements, evaluate whether I had an advantage or was in danger, recognize patterns, find the best course of action, you name it. Chinese chess became a ladder for me to climb over that wall to the brain gym with no knowledge membership fee needed to be paid. Most importantly, I was going to the brain gym without knowing or feeling like I was going there because I was doing what five-year-olds do best, having fun playing a game. Now, this all sounds great anecdotally, but let's get a little more specific with what someone as young as five is supposedly doing in the brain gym. Something intuitive that chess helps with is memory. And similar to the other things that chess hones, memory isn't something that can be directly taught or learned from a textbook like history or calculus. It's not really a subject, so you have to find activities to practice it in order to improve. As I transitioned to international chess in elementary school, my memory was put to work. Unlike typical classes, where my peers and I often cram study for the next test and forget everything afterward, I couldn't afford to do that in chess. If I just magically forget the variations of all of the openings I ever learned or how to defend a particular endgame, long story short, I'd get destroyed. Playing chess forces you to constantly recall the information you once learned. To illustrate this, a researcher established a chess program at a local school in Pennsylvania for sixth graders, none of whom had any prior experience playing chess. And even so, just nine months later, the kids who played regularly scored significantly higher on memory assessments. Creativity is another skill that is hard to directly teach. Many of my friends and I often pull the classic, oh, I suck at drawing, or I'm not a creative guy, excuse whenever we face any assignment that requires an ounce of creative expression. 
When I was in art class back in elementary school, I was that kid who drew the universal house of unoriginality with the same colors and the same shapes every single class. As I played more and more chess, however, I began to realize that I couldn't pull that uncreative excuse anymore. My favorite opening from back in the day was called The Italian Game, which goes something like this. I used to play this every single time I had the white pieces, no matter the circumstance. As I got older, though, my opponents started taking me out of prep by hitting me with the French, the Scandinavian, the Sicilian, and occasionally the not-so-glistening hippopotamus defense. I noticed that even if I internalized all of the main ideas of each of the thousands of different types of openings, after the first five, 10, 15 moves, I was going to have to think on my feet and develop positional ideas on my own for the rest of the game. This explains why researchers found that even preschoolers who regularly played demonstrated a significantly higher creative capacity than their non-chess playing peers. As my chess career continued, my willingness to try new things in art class increased as well. I progressed from the Italian in the house to the Catalan in abstract art. This pattern of chess teaching the unteachable skills applies to critical thinking, problem solving, concentration, endurance, impulse control, and much, much more. So, it's clear that chess does wonders for the brain at a low cost and in a fun way. Nerds nerding out ought to be good for intellectual purposes, but the word social and the word chess aren't typically compatible, right? But just as chess tears down intellectual barriers, social barriers, believe it or not, come down with them as well. As one example, my late grandpa was 80 years old when I began learning Chinese chess in kindergarten. He was delighted to know that I was picking the game up because everyone else in the family was too lazy to. We each had a playing partner now. And despite the huge age difference, his declining health and hearing, and my undeveloped communication skills, the game we shared was enough to make those barriers vanish. We talked about everyday things together, laughed together, complained about my parents, of course, and bonded on a deeper level overall. And interestingly, there is evidence that I'm not trying to give you a Bernie Madoff pitch on the non-existent social benefits of chess. A group of researchers found that similar brain parts are activated when considering a chess position and when considering a scenario that would elicit empathy. Chess players, regardless of skill level, are always taught to think about what their opponents want to do next. Why did they play that move? What's their plan? What do they think that I'm thinking of playing next? We constantly have to put ourselves in the other's shoes, which happens to be the classic definition of empathy. And that's just the tip of the social iceberg. Another group of researchers found that because chess players are trained to analyze and learn from the mistakes they made in previous games, chess playing kids of various ages demonstrated a significantly higher ability to cope with difficult social situations. These same children also became more sociable, confident, well-behaved, and even enjoyed studying more than during the beginning of the academic year. Now, I'm not going to act like I'm the exemplar of chess-induced social prowess, especially considering that it took me until junior year to finally get the guts to bring my passion for chess to high school. By this year, I was so desperate to start nerding out that I did some nerd hunting, found a couple of like-minded peers, and YOLO'd it by launching the St. Francis Chess Club. <laughs> and as fine chess players do, we began calculating variations, possibilities, of everything that could go wrong trying to promote a board game club in the 21st century. <laughs> but we missed the line where about 30 people from close friends to strangers would show up to the first meeting and be fully invested into their games while sharing some laughs from beginning to end, which is exactly what happened. That is the power of chess. Fundamentally, at its core, it's still a game. It's meant to be enjoyable, to be played with others, and to instill a sense of community. And it's easier than ever to start. You can buy a chess set that lasts for life for less than 20 bucks, or create an online account for free and start playing right away. 
you're not opposed to have any specialized knowledge nor be in a particular social group to play. As a matter of fact, in the previous studies I mentioned and in the broader chess research literature, chess players, whether rich or poor, Texan or South African, youngster or old fart, all reaped <laughs> similar benefits. They and we have unlocked a way to tear down intellectual and social barriers while having a good time playing a game. Most importantly, though, when you find yourself procrastinating because of TV, social media, video games, or whatever it is, if you just replace it with chess, maybe you can feel better about yourself, knowing that you weren't completely wasting your time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>